In the far north, Charters Towers Council has declared war on bats, launching a military-style offensive against the pests that have been plaguing the town for years. To be honest, I had no idea that we had these creatures living so close to us and for that reason I wanted to know more and the more I knew about them, the more I found out about them, the, the more I wanted to, to work with them. So it's just been, um, yeah, it's, it's been a pretty intense journey but I've learnt a lot of amazing things and I get to work with the best creatures on the planet, I think. Anyone who goes anywhere near a flying fox colony, one of the first things they notice of course is the noise. But it's not really noise, it's just the bats in effect talking to each other. It's no different from if you go into a shopping centre. You know, there's a lot of background noise of people just talking to each other and it just sounds like this mess of noise until you listen closely. The flying foxes, it's exactly the same thing. They're all talking to their neighbours arguing about whose bit of branch it is, saying, you know, don't hit me with your wing. Unlike some animals, their range of their hearing and the range of their voice is in exactly the same range as ours. So we've got this hugely anthropomorphic idea that they're noisy when, in fact, it's just, they're no different from us, really. Well, the most interesting thing to do is to get to know the flying foxes near you. So if you're lucky enough to live in the vicinity of flying foxes, go and pay them a visit from time to time. Go take a walk through Centennial Park. Visit some of the other colonies. Go and watch a fly out. Give yourself an opportunity actually to be captivated by flying foxes because they are captivating. It's amazing what just showing about to the public the response that you get. It's, oh my gosh, I didn't realise they were so cute. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that they weren't pests. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that they were a threatened species. And I like sharing that with people. I love sharing that with people. They're essential animals to our environment. They're a keystone species. They are the only long distance pollinators of our gum forests and yeah, we wouldn't have healthy rainforests without them. So I'm just starting my morning rounds um, and I have to do this every, every day. Um, I get up and I clean and I medicate and I treat and then I go off and do whatever else I'm supposed to do for the day, usually going to uni. Altogether, I've got 20, 20 bats. They've come in for various reasons, mostly fruit netting. Um, yeah, so you can follow me around and see what happens. I don't think it's that exciting, but <laughs> there you go. You can see the, the life of a wildlife carer. You know, I started going out with Tom when I, the year that I started bats, and I said to him, I go, look, I really love these animals, and you just, you're gonna have to take me and my animals, or not take me at all. And he, he must really like me, because he's put up with me for the last four years.
Western society, we've had a negative perception of bats now for about 2,000 years. Part of that's probably just an ingrained human fear of anything nocturnal, anything of the night. When Dante was looking to you know, describe the demons of hell, he actually described them with bat wings. That, of course, feeds on itself. If something becomes feared, then there's no incentive to understand it. People don't want to understand it, and the lack of understanding just drives more fear. Well, I think relationships with flying foxes probably got off to a bad start, in part because of European prejudices against that bat shape, but also because when it cut down the forests and put in the crops, if the crops are edible, flying foxes are going to eat them. They're not saying, oh, that belongs to the farmer. The farmer, you know, they're just saying, that's where I go for my food, there's the food. The most important thing to know about the disease side of things is it's mostly just blown out of proportion. Yes, there is a risk. It's a really, really, really small risk. Less than 0.1% of the wild population carry Australian bat lisa virus at any time. And the fact that with the rabies vaccine available, it's 100% preventable. So I think the message is don't touch wildlife. If you do get bitten by wildlife, tell somebody and get the appropriate treatment. Batcam is set up purely to keep me from doing anything productive inside the house. So I have a little monitor in my bedroom that's connected to these two cameras and there's a microphone on one of them. And so from my bed actually I can watch what's happening in my aviary and I certainly do <laughs> lie in bed and watch it <laughs> more than I should be doing other useful things like studying. Sometimes I think they might know that I'm watching because they come right up. <laughs> and they sniff and then they lick and try to chew on the, at the cameras. So uh, this is my bedroom now. This is where I have my sickest bats as well as my little bats. Microbats are tiny, tiny insectivorous bats. Most people would go through their life not ever seeing one at all um, or just mistake them for the common moth. We like them because they eat mosquitoes up to half their body weight in one night of mosquitoes. So my job is to save as many microbats as possible so that I can protect the world from mosquitoes. All right, here you go. Back to your warm spot. The main issue with uh, any of our bats, like most of the animals in Australia, is habitat destruction. The flying foxes, of course, live on the east coast of Australia, mainly, but that's the area we want to live. The native forests that they rely on are being steadily cleared. That, of course, drives the animals into the cities. Over the last 30 years, we've greened our cities and planted a lot of you know, nectar-bearing plants in cities. Um, so it's a bit of a double whammy as far as the poor flying foxes are concerned. We're destroying their native habitat, providing them an alternative, and then we wonder why they move into cities, and when they do, we persecute them. So what's, what's causing the decline in flying fox populations? Fucking human cruelty, basically, is what it is. We have laws in Australia that protect animals from human cruelty, because if animals aren't protected from human cruelty, humans will be unbearably, hideously cruel. So when Queensland went last year and exempted flying foxes from the animal welfare legislation, it meant that people could basically be as cruel as they wanted. Shooting them, electrocuting them, smoke, firecrackers, noise, water cannons, helicopters, down drafts, terrify them, break their little bones, paintball guns, shoot them. Just unbelievable, unbelievable stuff that you, you would not have thought that, that our fellow citizens would be capable of. Well, that's the sound of the 80,000 smelly, noisy and mostly unwelcome bats that have taken over this park. 
The Charters Towers Council wants to get rid of them and they've taken extraordinary measures to drive the bats out of town. They've been deliberately shooting at the bats, not simply to make the noise, but really shooting at the bats. So they have no chance to fly off. They have no chance to save their babies. They're just on the ground and they're probably injured. They could die. The, the problem really is that um, the people who hate seem to have so much more political clout than the people who love, and that I don't understand. This is where we do the soft releasing of most of our grey-headed flying foxes. This is where they come on the last part of their journey when they've been in care for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. They've got enough room in here so that they can build up some flight fitness because um, they need to be able to follow the food. Yeah. So I love getting that reaction from people that were naive to begin with and then they see a bat for the first time. And that's what I love doing, showing people um, what bats are and why they're important and that they're actually you know, really amazing little creatures. That's when I hope that those people can go and tell more people and, and that's, how we get, that's how we get change. The understanding is the core of it all. Without that understanding, um, as long as we have people who aren't prepared to listen, aren't prepared to learn, who just go, it's inconvenient, it's all about me, I don't want to put up with the wildlife, then we're going to have issues. At the end of the day, flying foxes, they were here long before humans. They will probably be here long after humans, uh, I hope so. Um, but they really aren't ours to just go out and kill. It's way past time for us humans to be living far more gently and peaceably on this earth.